Excellent. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, I have a an opinion right from the start about watermelon. Um, I like to eat my watermelon with sea salt and a little bit of lemon juice on it. Uh, brings out the flavor. Some of you probably think that's gross. Some of you probably love that. We can talk about that in the chat and in the discussion. Um, awesome. You should see a blank, uh, a black screen in front of you. We're going to start this talk with a video. Um, there's not going to be any audio. So if you don't hear any audio, um, that's okay. Um, so we're just going to start with a short video clip to watch and then we'll get right into it. Here we go. Uh-oh. I think it's a safe assumption to say that we've all seen videos like this on the internet before. Uh, maybe some of you have even seen this particular video, and some of you, even if you haven't, you probably can guess how this might end. Um, there's still drama here, even if you have seen this video, right? You feel bad for this girl. Her name is Abigail, because there's a reasonable chance that she doesn't come back from this, right? She fell, she tripped on the hurdle. This race is effectively over for her, potentially. At some level, I think we as humans sometimes feel like if you stumble even once, that that's kind of the end of it. Uh, my name is Dan Mall, like Vitaly mentioned. Up until last week, I ran a design system consultancy called Super Friendly, and we worked and consulted with some of the most recognizable brands on, in the world, like United Airlines and Pfizer and Athena Health on their design systems. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you some of the observations and the patterns that I've seen over the last decade so that you can learn from them too. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by highlighting a couple of inquiries from prospective clients over the, over the years uh, that are representative of some of the inquiries that we got during that time period. So as an example, back in 2014, this is the kind of inquiry we got. Uh, there's a lot of text on the screen. I'll read it through. Um, this email, the subject is International Website Framework. And the prospective client who got in touch with us said, I am looking for the next step in where we could be. I'm looking for someone to rewrite the visual style in a way that makes it extremely modular, like atomic design. I'm not interested in abandoning our original design. I want users to see this as an evolution. And this would be for our design of HTML and CSS, a style, plus a style, style guide, pattern library only, not implementation on our CMS, et cetera. I don't want to get overly detailed in this email, but is this a project that you would be interested in discussing further? Now, this, in hindsight, as we think about it here in 2022, this is a design system project. But in 2014, almost none of our prospective clients had that vocabulary yet. Right? You see some words that are hinting at it. You see style guide and pattern library and designing HTML, CSS, but we did, and, and atomic design, but we didn't really have that vocabulary quite yet. Not everyone did. If we fast forward to 2018, four years later, this is a direct message that I got on Twitter from a pr prospective client, not even an email. It says, hey, Dan, we're forming a design system team at company name, and I know that your company works in the space. Is there a way we can work together? Right. So notice just four years later is a very direct and specific message because we have vocabulary around it. It acknowledges design system work. A lot happened in those four years, apparently 2014 to 2018. And some of you listening are probably responsible for some of that with the blog posts that you wrote or the videos that you made or the conference talks that you attended and the discussions that you had. A lot happened in that time period that allowed the industry to kind of have new vocabulary around the work that we all want to do together. All right, fast forward some more, 2021, last year, three years later in an email, uh, the subject is design system project. That, that email says, we currently have a design system for the web experience of our company, but it's fragmented and we have a number of component libraries and silos throughout the org. We're revitalizing and funding a new core systems team tasked with defining a, a new component and pattern library. We'd like a partner to help our core system squad execute designing and developing the components and patterns necessary for an internal release at the end of H1 2022. We'd love adoption of the entirely new design system in Q4 2022. You'd be working directly with myself and our system squad, two designers, two engineer, UI engineers, one PM and one technical writer. So we'd like to be in execution mode if possible and bang out a list of defined components and patterns that amplify the brand and expressiveness of blank. Holy design system bingo, right? All of the buzzwords are here in 2021. All of the, the, the common words with design systems, um, component library, pattern library, adoption, system squad, execution mode, fragmented, component library, silos, core systems team, you know, all of the words are there. There's a lot more detail around teams and timeline and expectation and things like that. Last one to share just this year, 2022, earlier this year, the subject of the email was design system help. Curious to know if your team helps established design systems become better. We're in need of some help specifically around governance. Your company popped up in the discussion because you all work with this person and she works with us now. Is this something that your team can help with? 
So if we look at those kind of representative messages and we kind of plot it along a spectrum, if we were to sum up the differences in the inquiries we got almost 10 years ago and the ones that we got this past year, what I would say is 10 years ago in 2014 or, or eight years ago in 2014, most of the inquiries were about help us make a system. Right? The teams wanted help making a system. They generally didn't have them, so they wanted to create their first system. Fast forward to 2022, this year, instead of teams wanting help making a system, a lot of teams that got in contact with us already have a system, but now they want help getting people to use that system. And that is eight long years of hoping for something that hasn't happened yet. Right? Imagine starting a design system in 2014 and 2015, and in 2022, you're like, man, people are still not using this system. That's tough. The teams that reach out to us for help usually find themselves in one of two situations. The first one is where there's been a significant effort already put forth to create things like infrastructure and components and Figma files and architecture, and still no one really seems interested or, or they prefer doing their own thing. All the product teams and feature teams are like, nah, we have our own system. We'll kind of we'll kind of use that. We don't want one central one. I call this a design system ghost town. Right, you make a design system and you hope everyone to use it, and no one shows up, and you're like, "Where, where is everybody?" It is a sad, desolate place to find yourself. The second situation, I think, is where teams get a little bit more desolate and desperate. They've given up hope. They say things like, "We move too fast for a design system here," or "We're too large of an organization for a design system to be useful to us." And at these kind of companies, you can often find stories of several times over the last couple of years where they tried to make a design system and they failed for any number of various reasons. I call this a design system graveyard. But here's the point of all this. Why am I sharing this? Whether you've had a design system for many, many years, it's not getting any traction or adoption, or you're starting from scratch today, maybe you've never had a design system and you're like, I think we should have one, we should get started, you can be successful. I'm gonna share with you the same tips apply in both situations, and it all starts with the decisions that you make about your next component which is the title of my talk today, as Vitaly mentioned. No matter where you are in the design system journey, if you've had it for a long time or you're just starting from scratch, the decisions that, the decisions that you make about your next component, it makes all the difference. Back in April, I tweeted this. I said, I am so thrilled for this design system team that I've been working with. The team formed on February 7th. Yesterday, only 61 days later, they shipped system version 1.0.0 and a feature team implemented a component which was checklist item into their code base saying it saved them a week of, de of development time. All right, just 60 short days. And that includes weekends. So it's probably closer to like 40 business days, something like that. Now, this is a company that I worked with, and they were on their fourth try at a design system. They've had three design system ghost towns and graveyards. That means it's never too late for any team. Okay, so maybe you're thinking that that sometimes, you know, some, some maybe you're thinking some of the things that my clients generally think. They say, okay, Dan, so you, you've helped all these companies with their design systems. Well, what is the process for doing that? What's your process? And honestly, I think they're looking for some fancy diagram like this with circles and arrows pointing to each other and some sort of loop. You know, you find these when you do a Google image search for like design process. I think they're looking for stuff like first we celebrate, then we congregate, then we fornicate, then we triangulate, you know, blah, 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 all of the buzzwords. And they're looking for some concise system. Honestly, I don't really have that. Um, instead, I would say something like, well, there's about 50 things that our team would do over the course of three to four months. And they go, well, what kind of things? And I would list all these things and I try to describe them in a way that, you know, more than I should in a sales call and they'd get really confused. And so instead, my friend Crystal Vitelli and I, who I worked with on as a design system coach, we decided to write it all down in detail. And we turn that into this workbook. It's called Design System in 90 Days. I'm going to spend my time on, on this talk today just sharing what I think are the most important lessons of this book. Uh, I'm not going to talk, go through all 50. I'll share about four or five. Um, I think they're the most crucial and the most important just to give you a snapshot of it to help you get your design system adopted as quickly as possible. And if you like what you hear and you want to see more of the steps at the end of this talk, I'll also share a discount code for anybody who wants to check out the book in, in more detail. So make sure you're paying attention for that at the end of this talk. All right, so I said that the next component that you tackle has a major impact, which kind of begs the question, okay, so then where do we start with the next component? And to answer that, I want to share two quotes, two quotes that I love to share with design system teams to help them get oriented in, in the right place. Um, the first one is from the late Stephen Covey. He's a, an author and educator, and his most popular book was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, excuse me, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the principles in this book is one of my favorites says, begin with the end in mind. 
And I love this quote. It is so simple and it's so rich. Essentially, what it means is to begin each day, each task, each project, each component, each sprint with a clear vision of your desired direction and destination. So how do you know what the end is? Where do you find that? Well, usually if you work for a larger company, that is in your mission statement and vision statement. So the first activity in the workbook and the first place that I suggest starting with design systems, whether you're eight years in or eight days in or eight hours in, is assemble the North Star. Where, what is your company's direction? What is the mission? You know, The mission, the network strategy and vision define the strategic direction for a business. They provide the what, who, how, and why necessary to powerfully align action in complex organizations. Essentially, you want to align your design system to the trajectory of your company. Your company's mission and vision statements exist to help, ke to help keep everyone aligned. So ideally, your design system can help take some of the heavy lifting about alignment when it comes to user interfaces. So it makes sense to be able to tie the two together. So let's look at an example. Uh, this is Uber's website, their kind of corporate website. And let's look at the, the, the mission statement for Uber. Um, the, the mission statement for Uber says, we reimagine the way the world moves for the better. Now, the question that every team should be asking to keep them on track if they work at Uber is, how can our feature or our product reimagine the way the world moves for the better? How can our app do that? How can our customer service department do that? How can our design system help to reimagine the way the world moves for the better? Right? You want to align all of the things to the North Star of your company. So how do we, what do we do with that then? All right, so I mentioned I had two quotes. The first one is begin with the end in mind. The second one, here's the, the second one that I love that I, I love to share with design system teams. It's from Taoist master Lao Tzu. And he says, a design, uh, excuse me, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I love that sentiment. Design system teams are responsible for making vision happen, not for making vision right? That's probably relegated to your C-suite at your company. You look elsewhere in the organization for vision. You don't have to define it on your own. In fact, if you define it on your own, there's a good chance that there would be tension between that and the one that your company has. So your job is to take the vision that already exists and the mission and make it actionable through user interfaces, which is the point of a design system. You want your design system to go the distance, right? You want it to go the thousand miles. And so, and components of the lifeblood of design systems. So what is your first component going to be? I want you to think about that for just a minute. Now, whatever just went through your head when I said, what is your first component going to be? I want you to remember that answer for a minute. You don't have to type it in the chat. You can if you want, but just think about that for a sec, because I believe that this is the single biggest misstep that leads to design system ghost towns and graveyards. This line of thinking sets design system teams off on this unproductive journey, and they fool themselves into thinking that they're doing worthy and productive and important work. What do most design system teams think is the first step in their journey of a thousand miles? The first no brainer component that they should tackle. Maybe you're thinking it too. That component is the button component. Now, again, I said, I don't, I wouldn't ask anybody to raise their hands or put it in the chat or anything like that, but just, just think about whether button was the first thing that you thought of or the first thing that came to mind or the first place that you started. It seems obvious, right? It's simple. Every product team needs a button somewhere in their features. Every user interface has a button. And in my experience, innocent simple button has been the slippery slope downfall of many design system teams because once you have button you start to think well we have button right so we probably should have some some general typography styles and a base color palette defined and then some other basics like like form elements and headers and footers and foundations so let's explore why button is such a poor starting point first let me say that for all of you engineers here uh, from a technical standpoint, you know that button component is deceptively complex. I've never worked on a design system that had less than 10 variations of buttons, and they are very, very difficult, even though they look so simple. So I'm not going to get that into that now. Maybe we can talk about the technical details of button in the chat or in the discussion later on. Right now, I'm just talking strategically about button, so we're going to hold off on the, the technical aspects of it. Let's go back to Uber's mission statement. We reimagine the way the world moves for the better. Can we make a good argument? for how the button component helps Uber reimagine the way the world moves for the better. Now you might say, well, I mean, if we, if we added a little bit of animation that showed some movement and the key there is that when your voice goes high like that, well, maybe then you're probably in, in hot water. What about though, what about a map component? I feel like I can make a really strong argument for how the map component literally helps Uber reimagine the world, the way the world moves for the better directly tied to not just to their design system, but to their, uh, to their mission statement. 
Now, another reason that I'm convinced that button is a terrible early component is that it flies in the face of everything I've learned from a really important and sacred and prolific source of inspiration in my life, which is movies. Let's see what we can learn about design systems from movies. Um, type in the chat, how many people here have ever been to prison? No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't, don't type that in the chat. Um, what do movies teach us is the best and quickest way to get respect if you go to prison and you're the newest inmate on the block? Well, what you do is you go and fight the biggest guy around. Check out the news. I'm going to slather you up with an obvious jelly. <laughs> go to town. <laughs> Now, isn't that the kind of swag and respect that you want your design system team to have, right? Your design system team is like, oh, I'm, I'm with them. You know, your product designers are like, oh, don't, don't mess with us. <laughs> We're in their group. If you go to product teams and feature teams offering little old button component, they will laugh you out of the room. What team needs another team to provide button to them? Like, ah, oh, we can't do button on our own. If only there was a team here that could create it in a way that we could use it. No, that's silly. Most teams don't need that. But if you decided to take on the one of the most complex, nastiest, most intimidating components in the company, well, hey, that might earn you some respect. So how do you identify what those components are, though? What you do is you ask around. And, and there are three sets of activities that I'd like to share with you to help you get these answers really quickly. The first one is to collect feature teams roadmaps. So what you do is you get your hands on whatever is used at your organization to plan quarterly initiatives and to facilitate conversations about prioritization. What are the feature teams at your organization planning to do in the next three months? How are they broadcasting those plans? Really, that's what you're after. And I want to share with you the way that I do this. It's a very simple way. Uh, the, the format is not important. I generally do it in a fig jam. And essentially, how you track that can be very simple, right? So here's an example, a quick fig jam that lets you know at a glance what's coming up. So here's an example of a company that has four teams, a payments team, a bookings team, a social team, and a flights team, for example, if you're working with an airline. And so what I've done in this fig jam is really just here's a link to a, the roadmap for the payments team. It's a Google Doc. Here's a link to the Confluence roadmap for the bookings team, which links out to the team's OKRs and the JIRA boards and all that kind of stuff. Um, here's a screenshot you know, for the social team, uh, their JIRA board. And for the flights team, they don't have a formal route roadmap yet. They're making that right now. So I'm just annotating that in this fig jam. You can do this in, in notes. You can do this on a sketchbook, on a whiteboard, in fig jam, in Google Docs. It, the format doesn't matter. It just matters that you're capturing it all in one place. Okay, next up, um, then what you do is you interview potential design system customers. So you talk to all those teams and you go, all right, if I think those four teams are going to be able to use the design system, let's talk to them about what would be helpful for them. So what I suggest is you make a list of 15 to 20 people who you think would benefit from using the design system. And you interview each person for maybe 30 to 45 minutes, and you listen for stories about how product gets made, right? how they make product. We're going to come back to that story bit a little bit later. Uh, the reason that I think that this is an important step is that this is how you avoid the slippery slope of button component. Essentially, including the button component in the design system is typically an answer to a question that no one's asking. And that question is this. What components should we have in a comprehensive design system? The honest truth of it is that the only people who care about the answer to, the, to that question are people like me who give talks like this and people like you who listen to talks like this. People who are interested in design systems already as a craft, not as a necessary tool in their workflow and in their workload. Right? So a better question than this, instead of this, instead of asking what components should we have, instead you might ask, who can we help? Oh, sorry. Uh, skip. One of my favorite answers to this question comes from author Rory Vaden. And here he is in an interview with motivational speaker Ed Milet, and they're talking about the importance of our own experiences when we're making things for other people. So let's watch this clip. Again, it has video and audio here. All of us are most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. 
forward. You're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. And so when you look at the problem you solve, right, it's going, what, what challenge have I conquered? What obstacle have I overcome? What setback have I survived? Now we see something that's the opposite of, of design system in design system world, right? We see a lot of designers want to make a design system to help engineers build at a higher quality. And most times what that really means, honestly, is that the designers are tired of redlining and doing multiple passes of design QA on a build. It's a well-intentioned act, right? We're going to make a design system, so we basically eliminate that. It's also kind of a selfish motivation. Designers can't help engineers if they've never seen a, a line of React code. Right? Engineers can't help product managers if they think release cycles are garbage. You are most powerfully positioned to help the person you once were. That's what Rory just said in that clip. If you're a designer and the Figma tokens plugin help you design more consistently, then show other designers how to discover that new skill too because they were where you once were. If you're an engineer and the design system's approach to composability helps you code faster, teach other engineers how to do that too. That's why the interviews are so important. They help you discover people who are on the same path as you, but might be two or three steps behind. You went ahead of them so that their journey can be a little bit easier. I think that's a really important thing in design systems. All right, last activity here. Schedule product and feature walkthroughs. So track down all the emails of the promising teams, product owners, and product leads, and start scheduling times to walk through their products with them. Like do it on Zoom, do it in a screen share, do it in the same room, but essentially let them walk you through the, all of the nuances of their product. And while they're doing that, I'll, I want to show you something that I do um, at, in the same time that they're walking me through a product. So whether this is on Zoom or I'm in the same room, what I generally do is, again, in a fig jam, I'll create a couple of different surface areas depending on the teams that I want to work with. So here on screen, we've got a surface area for the payments team and the social team and the booking team and the flights team that we saw in the previous example. Uh, this is in a fig jam, but again, you can do this in any document, anywhere that you can create, um, and even better if you can create collaboratively um, so that other people can contribute to this too. So what you do is you create a surface area for each team you're going to talk to. And then as the payments team is walking me through, like here's their feature, or it may be even here that are wireframes for what they're going to do in, in the net new improved version, or whatever it is that they have, I just start writing down what components I see. All right, I see a pagination component. I see a tables component. I see a button group component, a select component. I don't know if they call them these things, but I'm just writing, it, the names don't matter. I'm just writing down, trying to identify some of the components that I see. All right, so after the payments team walks you through, you, you go like, all right, they, they're using these you know, 15 or 20 components in some of the screens that they showed me. Then you talk to the next team, you talk to the social team and you write down their components. And then you talk to the booking team and you write down their components. And then you talk to the flights team and then you write down their components. And this is the important part of all that. Once you talk to three or more teams, then you start to identify what are the common components that everyone needs. Right, so if you look at the payments team, yeah, they have an accordion on, in their uh, in in their product, but not everyone seems to need an accordion. But all of these that are highlighted in green here, you look at the ones and you say, well, it seems like everybody needs a card pattern, or everyone needs a badge, or everyone needs a rating component, or everyone needs tables. And what you do is you take all of those cards that you've identified that are common, and you separate them from the group, and you sort them by usage. Right, so you see in the top row here. We've got all the components that all, all four teams need. All four teams need autocomplete, button, group, and card. Notice button's actually not in there. The next tier, okay, what well, three out of the four teams need badge and button and rating and tabs and tables. So starting with button, we actually would not have started with the most common uh, component. That's the slippery slope. Most, most people assume that button is there, but once you do your inventory, you, you might actually find that there's something that's more important. So again, what does this tell you? Who is the toughest, meanest component that you should take down as a design system team and a design system org? Autocomplete. Why? Because it's the toughest and the meanest one. I think one of the primary responsibilities of a design system team or a design system designer or an engineer is to take on the most difficult, complex work so that it becomes easier for everyone else. Right? You, you want to define systems and process that don't need you to be able to, to function here. All right, so let's say you decide to tackle autocomplete, right? You talk to every team that's going to need it soon. You talk to these four teams already, but you've already, uh, you've already identified this. So you talk to other teams and go like, what are they doing with autocomplete? You understand intrinsically that some teams will need to support an icon in autocomplete while others don't. I icon should be required here or it should be optional. You get what props are required and what needs to be optional. Before you go off and build the new component from scratch, that new autocomplete component, 
Instead, what you should do is look to see if a team has already built it or tried to build it. And the chances are pretty high that that has happened. I think the design system team should very rarely start from scratch, almost never if possible. Instead, you should start amplifying the good that already exists. Instead of building something from scratch, if you can recognize something that a team is already building, then they feel celebrated and they're actually more incentivized to adopt the design system because they see some of their work in it already. Now, the difference is that the difference between getting an autocomplete from teams and you building autocomplete from scratch is that everyone built their version of autocomplete to serve their features needs. They didn't build it to be reusable by other teams. Why would they? They shouldn't. In fact, if, and then, then here's the other pitfall from design system teams is that they want teams to contribute autocomplete. If they contributed autocomplete to the design system, that would be a major problem. For most people, it's better for them to spend time on their core role instead of design system contribution. You actually don't want them to contribute because it actually creates more work for everybody to have to refactor it because they just built it for their product. So what's faster and better for you, the design team, the design system team, excuse me, who sees more broadly across teams is to figure out how to merge all of the different requirements and options into one harmonious usage. That's the advantage that you have from the purview that you have working on the design system. Once you have that, then you can start to usability test components with product partners. That's the next activity. It's time to see if your product teams can use the component all on their own. Uh, maybe some of you here recognize these two fellows. Um, if you don't, this is Patrick Collison and John Collison. Now, if you don't recognize those, that, those names, um, they are the founders of Stripe. And there's this famous urban legend in tech about them. It says, when they first started Stripe, they would demo it for other people in person. Now, for anyone that seemed interested, anybody that was like, yeah, that looks pretty cool, what they would do is it came to be known as the Collison installation. They would ask, hey, can I install it on your laptop right now? That's how they got such great adoption from Stripe early on. For whatever reason, I think our industry had this mythology about adoption, right? They're like, if we make the perfect design system, then adoption will just happen magically and automatically. People will find the system. It's going to be so compelling to them. They will just be drawn to it. They can't help but install the components in their bills. We can just sit back in our design system castle and watch the adoption graph hockey stick up and to the right. What a fancy mythology. No way. Getting adoption is active. We have to sell. We have to market. We have to evangelize. We have to sometimes beg, yes, beg teams to use our components. As soon as they say they're willing, there is no time like the present. Hey, let's get it set up on your computer right now. Remember the team that I mentioned in the, in the beginning of this talk, the team that started in February and finished in April? That's how we did it. Lots of demos followed by immediate installation with dedicated and quick iteration and bug fixes. All right, so you're actively working with teams, you're usability testing components with them, you're getting them implemented, you're getting adopted. That seems to be going well. You have a rhythm going. Now what? Now you document. Blech. I hate this. <laughs> not, not the idea of documenting, but really just the word. I think the connotation of the word is a, a slippery slope. You can't expect an organization to entirely change the way of working because you wrote that they should in your documentation. But isn't that how we generally let, write documentation? When we document, we often just write down our ideals. Here's how it should work in a perfect world. You know, do this and don't do this, right? And, and it's to prevent people from doing bad things. This is not at all helpful. Now, there's this scene for all of you Harry, Harry Potter fans. There's a scene in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince where Harry and his friend Ron arrive late to class. It's their first class of the year in advanced potion making. Now, Harry tells Professor Slughorn that they don't have textbooks yet, so he sends them into the closet to, to go get some. Now, in the closet, they find two books left. There's a brand new one. Uh, and there's this beat up old used one. Now, so Ron and Harry, they, they fight over it and Harry gets stuck with the old one. He's kind of grumbly about it. The first assignment that the professor gives them is to brew an acceptable draft of living death. That's the potion that they have to make. And whoever can do this will win a vial of liquid luck as a prize. Now, Professor Slughorn says that the recipe for living death is, on, is found on page 10 of the textbook. Everybody has it. But he also says only one student has ever managed to brew a potion of sufficient quality to claim the prize. Only one person ever. So Harry turns, opens his book, and he discovers that his old textbook says, property of the half-blood prince. And in, the, in the, the margins of the book, there's all these notes that show him how to successfully brew this potion. We're going to watch this clip. Uh, just watch what happens next.
how to do that. Crush it, don't cut it. No, the instructions specifically say to cut. Oh, really? Jane's beard. She's perfect. So perfect, I dare say one drop would kill us all. Now we saw things like these notes in the margins of the book. So Harry had written in his book, or the Half-Blood Prince had written, crush with blade releases juice better, even though the instructions say cut. And in other places it says 13 beans instead of 12. I think the important part about this is that reference sites aren't instruction manuals. In fact, they're supposed to be historical record. What you do is when you're using a design system, you try to follow the textbook, but instead you should, but, but it, when it doesn't work, you can make notes about where the textbook just isn't right. I think that's the design system, not the textbook itself. The design system is the notes in the margins. That's the kind of contribution that we can expect from teams, not fully packaged components, but we want them to contribute their stories and their solutions. And they want to, we want them to contribute what didn't work so that we can update it and we can get better at telling people how to do it. So instead of thinking about documenting, I like to think about it like chronicling. Documentation can be written before you design and build everything. And I think that's the danger. And that way it has more of a tendency to be an instruction manual. But chronicling, chronicling can only happen after the fact. And that's you allowing people to be successful. It's you going through a journey first and going, ah, oh, that's not right. This doesn't, this doesn't work the way that I expected to. And updating that journey and chronicling that for the next person who comes along. I was lucky to be able to work with the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty team a couple of years ago. Uh, what they do is they report the country, they don't report the news in countries and regions where the free press is outlawed or banned. I think they're doing really incredible and important work. This is the homepage that we built with a new design system we made together back in 2015. Now, if we scroll down to the middle of this page, you see a section there that's kind of banded off in a darker color and in dark gray. Um, we see this component, it kind of takes up the whole row with a great background. In, in the world, uh, the component goes by a couple of different names. So you might see this component, you're like, oh, I know what that is. That's called a, right? So just think to yourself, you could post it in the chat if you want. Um, who would call it a carousel? You know, maybe write a, a plus in the chat if you would call it a carousel. Um, how about how about slider? You know, write, write a, a plus in the chat if you would call it a slider. Like maybe you would call it a slider. How many of you would call it a Fred? Yeah, I'm guessing not very many of you. But in fact, this is what the team at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty calls that component. It's called the Fred. And if you don't believe me, you can actually view source on this page. Um, this is a screenshot from last week. Um, you can view source. And right here, I'll highlight it. It says div class equals Fred content. All right, it's, it's right there. Now, again, we made this design system in 2015. And to this day, a week ago, they still call that thing Fred. Look at the longevity that Fred has had there, right? They have used the same vocabulary for seven years or more. If you ask anyone at Radio Free, Free Europe, there's no question about what this component is called. And this is when I learned one of the biggest lessons in design systems that I carry with me to this day. I share with as many people as I can. It's this. It doesn't matter what you agree on. It just matters that you agree. Is Fred the right name for this component? Absolutely not. But who cares? The team has clarity and it allows them to move forward. Everyone makes such a big deal about naming. Naming is hard. No, it's not. Getting people to agree on something is hard. Don't spend a lot of time finding a name for a component. Pick a name quickly and then spend a lot of time convincing people to use it. I kid you not, I had a, a new parent um, on a design system team that I work with recently, and they told me that they spent less time naming their child than they did some components in the design system. <laughs> this is absolutely ridiculous. Do you all know who this is? If you know who this is, you can, you can write it in the chat. This is Princess Leia. 
She's a character from Star Wars. How about how about this? Some of you know who this is. This is Luke Skywalker uh, from the Star Wars canon. This is uh, this is Darth Vader. You probably know who this is. How about this guy? Hmm, this one's a little bit tougher. So some of you might have guessed that this is Han Solo. Uh, this is not Han Solo. This is a character named Dash Rendar. He's kind of a Han Solo light. He's a smuggler without care. He's a pilot of his own freighter. He's known for his ability to get out of sticky situations. But he's not in any of the movies. I think he's in a couple of the books or comic books and maybe, maybe a video game or something like that. Now, in Star Wars, in the Star Wars universe, there's this concept. And that concept is called canon. And what canon means in Star Wars is they are the immovable objects of Star Wars history, characters, and events to which all other tales must align. So in every Star Wars story, Darth Vader is a character. There's no, there's no universe or multiverse where it's like, oh, yeah, Darth Vader doesn't exist here. We don't know about him. He's a, he's a, a canon character. Dash Rendar is off canon. So some stories include him. Some universes are like, no, not really. And, and characters and events and, and history can move in and out of canon. I think a design system is an organization's canon. It's a collection of stories. It'd be good if most of those stories were official. Yes, we, this is the card component that everyone here uses. It also would be better if some of those stories were actually unofficial, even if temporarily, right? Sometimes we call those snowflakes or one-offs. Yeah, we have this component. We don't really think it should be part of the system quite yet. Only one or two teams need it. So we're going to keep this as off canon until more teams need it, and then we will adopt it as part of canon. I shared a small slice and combination of plays and activities that you can run to put your design system on track or, or back on track. And what's cool about this is you can do this anytime, whether your design system is eight years old or eight days old, like I was mentioning before. The, the sequence goes like this. Assemble the North Star, collect, collect some feature teams, roadmaps, interview potential customers, schedule product walkthroughs, and usability test components. You can do this cycle over and over. This is the same process that I use when I work with new teams and when I work with teams that have had design systems for many, many years that want to improve their governance or contribution process or anything like that. We just run through this cycle and develop the practice of doing this uh, with design systems. If you're discouraged about where your design system is right now, it's not too late to turn it around. You can use these steps to be able to do that. Remember Abigail that we had in the beginning of this talk? Let's finish her story. So let's see how this story plays out. Yes, look at that. Abigail won her race. And how do you think Abigail felt after all of that? Well, no better way to find out than to ask her. I kind of expected that stutter after I went over with the wrong foot, but I literally didn't expect to like lay out and like Superman fall. So I, can, I think I was kind of just startled, but like I was, it was kind of more like a, you got to get back up and finish this more than like a, oh my God, what just happened? You know what I mean? I think that's probably the best note that we could end this talk on. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I would add a coupon code here for anyone that's interested in checking out more of the activities in the workbook that can help design system teams create a sustainable design system practice. So you can go to this URL and use the code SMASHINGMEETS2022 for 15% off. With that, I would like to say thank you to Vitaly and the whole Smashing crew for having me and to all of you for listening. Um, thank you for being great listeners. I hope you enjoy the rest of this session here with the next two amazing speakers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Dan. Wow, that was incredible, as it always is. Well, um, I, I love the fact how you actually put out all the references and kind of all makes sense because very often we, when we think about design systems, it always feels like we need to start with naming components and we need to start kind of building out those components and then you kind of keep going and you try and hope for the best that is going to be established eventually. Um, there are also many, many questions coming in the chat. So let's maybe just have two of them quickly now, and then we can uh, bring up more in the panel later. Uh, one came up very, very quickly from Meredith in the chat. I uh, would love to hear how this would work for a tiny company without a full team and the formal branding or mission statement campaign. That's probably going to be the North Star that you spoke about early. Great question. Uh, thank you for that, Meredith. Um, Let's start that by saying, I think it's dangerous and, and relative danger here. 
it's dangerous to work for a company without a direction, right? If, a, if your company doesn't have, you know, if it's, if it's brand new, I get that. Um, a company that doesn't have a direction means that people are going to be aimless. In that scenario, that doesn't mean it's hopeless. In that scenario, what you can do is you can actually use your design system as a catalyst to help people go, oh, no, no, that's not where we should go. You know, it kind of helps to, to align them by, by, by surfacing what sh where you shouldn't go. Right. So, for example, if you made a design system, and you said, well, you know what we should do? We should have a lot of components like that are very dense, like data tables and things that are very transactional. And you can build those things and have people look at them and go, that's not the kind of company that we are. And you can actually back into a mission and a vision that way. Um, so that might be a thing that might help you for a small company. You know, at larger companies, it's probably more rare and also harder. But at, at a smaller company, you can probably do that pretty quickly and use that as a way to have people go like, oh, no, no, that's not what we want to do. You can kind of use your design system as a catalyst to move your, your company along. So I hope that's helpful. All right. And then there was also a question from Russ. And I think that this is probably something that many people have been wondering about. Shouldn't a button be designed way before the button group is designed? Doesn't one build off the other necessarily? Isn't it more logical to do it the other way around? It's a good question. It does feel obvious that like, well, shouldn't button group contain buttons? Um, that said, I've worked with many teams who design button group before they design button and they use button group as a holder for any button that teams have. So rather than the design system have, having a, uh, a component that's like, this is our canonical button. Instead, they go, well, this is how our button group is going, is going to uh, function. This is how it's going to work maybe from a layout standpoint. Um, and then any team that uses that button group can actually insert their own buttons however they want to do it. And the button group has sort of some overriding controls for those buttons. So yeah, good point. It does seem counterintuitive that button group should be designed you know, before, uh, after button is designed. But sometimes teams can put their own buttons in it you know, and, and that allows for a level of kind of composability and flexibility. Right. And maybe the very last one, I think it's actually very much connected to the one that we just answered. It seems like this has really hit the nail there. Um, if we create an autocomplete as first component, we will need color palette, topography, spacing, layout, etc. Shouldn't you build this foundation components first yet again? Uh, I say no, obviously, from my talk. Uh, I say no because sometimes you don't know those things. And I think, when, I think it's about mindset. If you think about color, when you think about something like color palette, your mind often goes to a thing that, that should not be changed elsewhere, right? Like, oh, color palette is like our official color palette. You know, typeface is our official typeface. And that, to me, I see that slow down team so much. They spend six weeks trying to figure that out where I'm like, let's just pick a typeface. We can always change it later. So will you need a typeface? Sure. Do you need your brand? Maybe not. And to me, that's all about mindset more than it is about specific decisions. So do you need colors? Absolutely. Do you need your color palette? Not if it makes people think about going slower. So I think a lot of that is, is about moving things along. Pick a color, pick a typeface. You can always change it later. And you can change it at scale if you build a connected system. So most of my point about that is about moving things along more than it is about a sequence of events. Uh, I wrote this blog post called The Folly of, of Foundations in Design Systems. And, and the idea that, like, that you have to do things first and then you build on top of that is actually just not true in digital. Because if you think about color palettes, color palettes change all the time. So why do we consider it a foundation? Why do we consider it a thing to build on top of? You can always swap it out. You can always swap out type. Like, because it's digital, you can always change it. And so to me, the idea of foundations actually just leads people down a wrong path of thinking, not in terms of assets, but it makes them think, oh, we have to settle something first in order for it to be used. And I think, just think it slows down too much. Right. Well, I did promise that you have some opinions about things, right? So I probably wasn't too wrong on that. You certainly right? were not. That's great. That's great. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, then, for being with us. Uh, dear friends, uh, we will be pro... Well, we will... We will, we will no. Oh, it's, it's already late here. Uh, we will be coming back with Dan in a panel uh, where I then might actually answer a few more questions that you have brought in the chat. And of course, feel free to add them in the chat or in the Google Doc, and we'll be bringing them up as well. All right. Thank you so much for being with us, Dan. I think that Dan deserves maybe, again, a round of... Do you have a second favorite fruit? Then, uh, I love uh, oranges. I don't, is, oranges. There, is there an orange emoji? Let's go with, with apple. The, like probably lemon, an apple lemon work, maybe? Oh, yeah, lemon. Lemons are great, yeah. yes. All right, excellent. So <laughs> let's go with that. So please, everyone, give a round of lemon emoji to Dan. Thank you so much for being with us, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Billy.